if I can bring the passion of martial arts to kids at a young age, get them excited enough to choose that over other sports in the beginning, then I think I'm doing my job. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 556, with today's guest, Setsi Olivia Roney. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What's that mean? Well, if, if you want to know, if you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. And one of the things you're going to find in our home is our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that gets you 15% off all the stuff that we've got available there. Everything from apparel and training aids to training programs and more. Now the show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website. And because I name all websites boring, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. Maybe boring isn't the right word. But the show, well, we give you two episodes each week. And the whole purpose we do that is to connect and educate and entertain all of you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you appreciate what we do and you want to support Whistlekick, there are a few things you can do. Like I said, you can go to the store, you can buy something. But you've also got a number of other choices. You could follow us on social media, share an episode, buy a book on Amazon, leave a review somewhere, or support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick is the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as two bucks. And the more you throw our way, the more we give back. Yes, even at the $2 tier, we're giving you behind the scenes exclusive content, stuff you're not going to find anywhere else. And at the higher tiers, we give you more and more and more. You talk to someone who teaches martial arts, you will quickly find out that they have a particular style. Not just a style of martial arts, but a style of teaching. They like to teach certain things to certain people. And the most polarizing group of people to teach that I have found are very young children. And I, I don't mean just kids. I mean young kids, like three to five-year-olds. In my time, I have found that martial arts instructors either love that age group or they avoid it. Well, today's guest not only doesn't avoid it, but built an entire business around teaching this age group. And we have a great talk. We talk about how she does it because it's different than the way just about anybody else does. And we talk about why. It's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Sensei Roni, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your willingness to come on and, and chat about whatever it is we're going to chat about. You, you, you know, we just talked about it. Listeners know we don't, you know, we don't, we don't often have an agenda when we bring a guest on. It's just, hey, let's let's talk to a martial artist. Let's see what comes out of it. And sometimes we have some some intense conversation. Sometimes we have funny conversation. And uh, I gotta say, I don't have a bead on you yet. I'm not sure what kind of conversation we're gonna have. We'll find out. <laughs> that was a little bit foreboding. Uh, <laughs> cool. Well, here on the show, you know, it's. The, the thread that we have running through everything, the people that, that listen and you and I and the people who work on the show, it's all about martial arts. So let's, let's roll back. What's your martial arts uh, origin story, if you will? Sure. So I got started with Shito Ryu Karate um, many, many years ago. And um, I have kind of a, a cool story about how I got started. Um, I'm the second oldest of seven kids and um, raised by a single mom. And my cousins got involved in a martial arts program close to where I grew up, which, which is in Northwest Indiana. And upon hearing about it, I just became obsessed with this idea of martial arts. I had never heard of it before. You know, we didn't watch TV and movies growing up. So I had no idea that there was this, there was this awesome thing called martial arts out there. And uh, my cousins got started and I talked them into taking me with them for like three class and just became so extremely obsessed with this idea of becoming a martial artist. So I ran home, told my mom about it. I'm like, hey, I need, I need to join this program. I want to get my black belt. And she sort of laughed because, you know, second oldest of seven kids raised by a single mom. She's like, yeah, there's no way we can afford that. Absolutely no way you're going to be able to take these lessons. And I was pretty determined, little 11-year-old, and uh, was able to go back to that studio and talk the sensei in there 
to, into letting me take classes for free in exchange for cleaning school. So I was there five nights a week, scrubbing floors, cleaning mirrors, and um, really got my start that way. And then eventually ended up taking over the kids program and ended up running the whole dojo, um, getting my black belt there and then starting my company from there. So martial arts has had huge impact on my life overall. And um, it's just really been part of, become part of who I am as a person. How old were you that first class? 11. 11. Okay. So yeah. I'm trying to wrap my mind around an 11 year old who is so determined and creative with, with getting things to happen that you go back and you say, I will, I will trade you my time for classes. I will clean. Now, plenty of people have cleaned schools in exchange for classes. I mean, that, that's not, that's not, um, it's not foreign. We've heard about that on this show, but I don't think we've heard about a kid doing it, let alone it being the kid's idea. So what, what would you chalk that up to? Where'd that idea come from? Um, so I'm homes. I was homeschooled growing up and that was something that I was like, what am I really good at? You know, homeschooled kids are typically really good at cleaning. <laughs> They're <laughs> definitely used them for chores like that. And so I'm like, this is what I have to offer. And it was also, you know, I have a ton of younger siblings, so I can help out in those classes. I don't know anything right now, but I could, you know, play games with them or whatever. And um, he took me up on that offer almost immediately. And uh, that's where my, my real passion um, came into play was I, I love teaching kids martial arts. Mm. This, this creative problem solving, you know, did that, did that come through? Was that the way you were raised? Was that uh, something that came out of homeschooling? It, it reminds me very much of the, the mindset in the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, yeah. you, you had, you had a target. There was something you wanted and it wasn't, you know, your mother said, we can't do that. And you instead heard, we can't spend money on that. And you found you found a solution. So we're that that creative problem solving. I, I've got a feeling. So this is me foreshadowing now. I've got a feeling we're going to hear about that as we talk about other things. But I'm curious where the root of that ability to think outside the box came from. Yeah, I do think that has a lot to do with being homeschooled. Um, and there are a lot of pros and cons with homeschooling. I feel like um, I was definitely behind in a lot of ways um, getting into college, but the uh, creative abilities that I gained through homeschooling, I, I don't think that I would have um, anywhere close to the creativity that I have if I would have gone to a traditional school. Um, so yeah, I think um, problem solving as a whole is something that uh, I learned a lot of in homeschooling, potentially was you know born with some of that as well. Um, but in the company that I have, Crouching Tiger, this we we use a really creative approach to a lot of a lot of different problems, and so we look at problems that children are having within schools, problems that children are having within homes, and we come up with really creative ways to to get solutions to those problems to children through our curriculum, through our characters, through our stories. Um, so that's a really big part of really everything that I do as a person and everything my company, Crouching Tiger, does as well. Okay. All right. And so the other thing I want to I want to pull out a little bit thread wise is this instant passion for martial arts. I mean, did you have any idea? You know, quite often on this show, we hear about, oh, I, I, you know, I watched a lot of Bruce Lee movies as a kid or, you know, there was something else that contributed to this latent desire to train. I didn't hear any of that from you. I heard this instant, um, this switch that seemed to go off to say this, this is, this is where I need to spend my life. Yeah, it was, um, pretty, it was pretty interesting that you know, I'd never, I'd never heard of martial arts. I had never, um, seen a movie, a television show or anything until I was 11, which I think is pretty rare. Um, and I remember going to the library and checking out every book about martial arts that I could find. Um, just when my cousins told me about it, that so was like, what is this thing that I've never heard anything about? And let me dig into it and learn everything that I can. So by the time I showed up for my first lesson, I knew some stances, I knew how to count to 10 in Japanese, <laughs> I knew um, how to tie a belt, you know, I, I had really researched it, So it might be just sort of an obsessive kind of personality that I had 
as a child and maybe still have now as an adult, um, this ability to hear about something and become so engrossed in it and obsessed with um, learning everything that I could possibly learn about it. All right. So you started, you, you didn't stop. You didn't step away. You didn't quit. You just kept finding new, I guess, roles within this school. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, cleaning the school at first and then it was helping kids classes and that was helping marketing, um, to the point where I was finally just really running the entire school. Um, my instructor was able to take a step back and work on some things that he had been wanting to work on. And, um, in high school, I was managing the entire school by myself, which was a really great experience for me to gain, um, before starting my own company. Mm -hmm. And when when did the idea of starting your own business around martial arts start? Yeah, so I actually started this company, Crouching Tigers, when I was 20. I was in college at the time. I had moved away from where I'd grown up in Northwest Indiana, a couple of hours south to Indianapolis, Indiana. And I was working for a martial arts school at the time, you know, got, got a job that would uh, really help me support myself through college. And the, um, the company that I was working for at the time, um, I didn't realize this going into it, but they were very quickly going under. And it became very obvious when they started bouncing my paychecks. Never a fun thing with paying your way through college. Um, and so I knew that there were some companies um, up north where I had grown up that did a mobile program. So they took a bus or whatever to local child care centers and after school programs, and they offered classes on site to these kids. And it just seemed so simple to me. You know, why not do this for martial arts? Martial arts is an activity that isn't typically available to this very young age group. And it's usually a lot more expensive than how I would be able to price classes because I'm mobile. So I don't have that overhead. And um, yeah, I got that started when I was 20 years old. And it just started with knocking on doors. Hey, my name is Olivia. I teach karate. I think the kids will like it. Can I come in and teach a free class? And it really, really grew from there. And um, it's been an awesome, awesome business to be in. Like I mentioned earlier, low overhead is really an amazing aspect to it. But this ability to reach younger children and to reach children whose parents typically wouldn't have the time and money to invest in a martial arts program, it's just reaching an entire new demographic of children, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Most people that talk about teaching martial arts either love teaching children or do not love teaching children. Sure. Uh, usually it's it's either, you know, th this is this is my passion. I love working with the kids. I like I like teaching the adults too, but you know, the kids are are where my focus is, or the kids are what keep the school afloat so I can afford to teach the adults because there aren't as many adults interested in martial arts, generally. Sure. Yeah. It seems pretty clear that that you know kids are what resonates for you. Kids are your your passion. You you know that this doesn't sound like there are a lot of variations on the business model that you considered before jumping in. So the question is, even at twenty, you're still pretty young. I think a lot of people would say you're still a kid yourself. What was it about teaching kids that excited you? Because it's you sound excited as you're you're telling the history of this yeah i there's something about teaching these very young age groups that is just really inspires me um not only are these children like little sponges you know where you teach them something and you just notice how quickly they retain that information and then you know it can even become part of their personality you know teaching them new skills and teaching them confidence and things can really shape them as a person um, I'm somebody who's very optimistic about the future. I feel like the young children that we are raising right now are going to have the abilities to completely change the world in the future. I feel like the way that science and technology are aligned so well for this age group that we're teaching right now that they are going to solve all of the world's problems. I know that sounds probably obnoxiously optimistic, um, but I, I really am, uh, have a very positive outlook on the future. And I think the more that we can do to reach kids at these very young ages and to teach them 
you know, by putting positive instructors in front of them and teaching them positive lessons, their stories, um, and things that they're going to, that are really going to help shape them as people, the better chance they're going to have of, of making those, those big world changes that I just mentioned. Mm. I, w- I want to unpack that a little bit. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's incredibly optimistic. Uh, it's, it's positive. It's, um, it, it really speaks to your passion, I suspect, for children. When I, when I think about the people I know who deal with, and, and I assume we're talking about, you know, like three to five-year-olds? Three to five is really my, my favorite age okay. group. Um, that, our program goes up to eight years old. Um, and I okay. think there's a big, big difference you can make in that entire age group. But I would say sure. more specifically, those, those three to five-year-olds are your little sponges that are just soaking up all the information. Mm. Here. Especially when you have a black belt on and you're teaching them through martial arts is really how you inspire them. Mm, yeah. And and I don't know that prior to me asking you had said three to five, but that was just kind of what, what was coming through the way you were talking about these kids. And when, when I think about the people I know with a passion for early childhood education, you know, whether it's, you know, kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, preschool, uh, you know, anything like that. I'm, I'm just kind of running through the folks I know who have been involved in those programs. And they all tend to have an insane amount of optimism. Just so fundamentally believing that these kids will transform, not just grow up and be functional adults, but they will transform the world. And here we're hearing you saying something similar, where did that idea start for you? Um, I think it's probably um, just from observing the children that I've worked with in the past and observing the children within our, our program who my instructors have taught in the past and just watching their ability to change. You know, I think as adults, it's so difficult to change yourself. And then you even think about trying to change somebody else. And it just seems impossible. Um, but with young children, I think that they're so adaptable and um, so able to make such huge changes by learning very simple lessons. And through our program, we tell a lot of stories. Every single week, there's a new story. Um we have these seven tiger characters that are, you know, the crouching tigers. They're all named after natural disasters and they're modeled after members of my own family, which if that tells you anything about my family. <laughs> natural disaster names definitely make sense for us. And um, you said you had six siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So we each have a tiger character. And like I said, we're named after natural disasters because, you know, we're all kind of a hot mess in our own way. <laughs> um, my, my family loves it, that I have these stories about them. Um, but every week there's a story about these tigers learning a new lesson. So it might be something simple like confidence. You know, they keep trying to do something over and over again and they're gaining confidence along the way. Uh, it might be something that's more safety related where, they're learning uh, not to open the door unless they know who's knocking on it and what to do in those cases. Um, but it's really interesting to me to see how quickly children pick up on these stories and how quickly they're able to relate them to their own lives. And um, I think that's why you know children's books are so important and so prevalent today for children is because they really truly do make a difference in the way that children function after they've learned those lessons. Um, I feel like it's so easy for them to relate to them. Mm-hmm. So I've got to ask, are, are one of these characters modeled after you? Of course. Yes. I'm okay. And can, you, tiger. <laughs> can, can you, how, what's that? What's that? Can, can you tell us which one? Can you yeah. tell us a bit about your cat? We probably don't want to go through all seven, but right. maybe we can unpack the one that you identify with. Yeah. So I'm Tornado the Tiger. She's the second oldest of the seven tigers, um, kind of the leader of the family. She's uh, she's into meditation and, of course, martial arts. And she's sort of the one that leads her family, all of the tigers, on, on fun tiger adventures. Uh, she kind of helps them put things together. Um, as they're learning lessons as a family. And um, yeah, she's, she's a pretty cool tiger. <laughs> where did the idea for the tigers come from? 
Um, so I named the company Crouching Tigers. And uh, I can't say that I that I never heard of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, because of course I did. But I do own the trademark Crouching Tigers. Um, it took a long, a long time to get there, but I I'm sure. finally got there. Thanks, Weinstein. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I, I had this mascot tiger to begin with. And I just, before I, when I would teach stories to kids, I would pick different kids in my class out and say, okay, well, let's pretend that Johnny and Billy, which Johnny's funny, we'll talk about that later, how we always use Johnny in martial arts terms, <laughs> but Johnny and Billy are, you know, having an argument and then this happens. And I take them through an entire story of how to manage conflict. And that was working really well for our class. And I found that kids were hearing it and they were remembering it, talking to their friends about it, talking to their teachers about it, going home and talking to their families about it. Because you know, parents would email me and say, oh, I heard that there was a story about Johnny and Billy and this is how they handled the conflict. And that was an easy way to teach these lessons to them. But I saw an opportunity to have some illustrated characters that would be more exciting to those kids. And so I created these these seven tigers. I didn't illustrate them. That's, that's not my strong suit whatsoever. Um, but got them illustrated. And they really just came to life through our instructors telling stories. They each have their own pose and their own martial arts technique to go along with them. And kids just became obsessed with these tigers as if they were like superheroes in stories that they were hearing about and they would go home and talk about them and they wanted they constantly want more even now that i have all these illustrations and things out there for them they want more what's their favorite color how old are they what's their favorite move what's their favorite movie you know and it's it was just a really interesting way to get kids even more invested in our lessons and retaining our information and our story even better by having these tiger characters it sounds like they're identifying with them. Definitely. With yeah. with seven choices, I, I would suspect every kid's going to find at least some of themselves and probably multiple. Yeah, definitely. Tigers, yeah. Well, interesting. Well, it's I think it's a good time to kind of take a take a hard left and talk about you and and your training. Now, it's we're going to come back. We're gonna we're gonna talk more about what these classes look like and the kids and, and, and all that. But I want to get a little bit more context for you and your training, because from the beginning, martial arts was something you were passionate about. But all the ways that you've talked about that have been in relation to a role or someone else. So let's talk about how martial arts started to impact, if it did, I guess, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, that martial arts started to make an impact on who you are? Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. Because you kept going, and from the, the hundreds of people that we've had on the show, they all seem to have a few things in common. One of them is that martial arts tends to fill some gaps, plug holes, create some personal growth, you know, however you want to term it. And I'm wondering what that looked like for you. Sure. So as the little 11 year old me is like bold as I was with this ability to go and, and talk of a uh, school owner into letting me take classes for free, um, I was really lacking confidence. And um, I mentioned I was raised by a single mom. Um, it was right before that time that I started martial arts that my dad just got up and left, you know, all seven of his kids and his wife. Mm. And um, it was just a really tough time for me mentally as kind of a, a daddy's girl growing up to just have him completely uh, run away from the family. I was really, really lacking confidence. Um, and I was really afraid. For some reason, at that age in my life, everything made me really nervous. I was constantly fearful um, for some reason that I was going to be kidnapped. And um, to the point where I, I got a handheld BB gun for my birthday one year and I used to sleep with it under my pillow. So I was a really, really afraid wow. little girl. Um, another, I call it a funny story. Now looking back, I'm sure at that time I was just so fearful. Um, but it's something that we joke about in my office these days is when we would get packages in the mail when I was a kid, there was those little silica packets that say, do not eat on them. And in my kid brain, I thought this means that it's poison. And if you eat it, you will die immediately. 
And so when we would get these packages in the mail, I would take these little silica packets and put them in my pocket because my idea was that I was probably going to get kidnapped and they were probably going to take me to a house and they were probably going to be like, make me some coffee. (laughs) And then I would just dump the silica packet (laughs) in their coffee and stir it up and give it to them. And then they would die to get away. (laughs) I know that's really ridiculous. (laughs) Um, but that you can see sort of where, where my creativity kind of started. <laughs> so yeah. I, I was this really, really fearful child, um, always thinking that something terrible, like being kidnapped was going to happen to me. And when I found martial arts, I found this inner strength and this confidence that, um, I was really, really lacking. And that was just so helpful for me to understand that, you know, bad things like this do happen, but there are ways that you can prevent them. And, you know, having confidence, I think, is, is a huge way um, for us to teach kidnap prevention for, for children. Um, but martial arts as a whole gave me that, that inner strength and that confidence to really overcome these, these insane fears that I had growing up. Um, I think a lot of them were because my mom has always been very good at, um, at teaching us prevention maybe too good at at some times where she would do it in a, in a threatening way. Um, And so when I started to develop the curriculum for crouching tigers, a lot of it is based on how do we teach this really important lesson to kids without scaring them. Um, And so we've had to put a lot of creativity and those tiger characters are very helpful. Um, But that's a really, really big part of our program because I don't want kids to live with that same fear that I had growing up. I don't want them hiding silica packets in their pockets and I don't want them sleeping with a handheld BB gun under their pillow. Mm. See, I had the same fear around those silica packets, but my solution was more to, you know, treat them like hazardous materials and throw them in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even considered using them as a weapon. Yeah. Well, now you know it's an option. <laughs> now, now, I, now I know. Now I know it's a terrible option. But still an option. (laughs) What did you study in college? Did it line up at all with what you're doing now? Um, I studied communication and um, it's a liberal arts degree. So I've always had um, a gift for writing and public speaking. So it was it was more what can I do in college while running this business that's going to um, end with me getting a degree. And it was, it was more or less the, the easier choice for me, but I was definitely working like 60 hours a week while I was in college. So it was the right choice for me to be able to balance both those things. And I'm going to guess that there were points where you said, man, college is getting in the way of my job. For sure. Yeah. Well, I started actually studying pre-physical therapy with communication studies as my degree, um, you know, thinking that I'd become a physical therapist. And when I started my company, you know, we started out with like 20 students and then kept growing from there. And um, it was it wasn't until the end of my senior year that I had the choice to make. Do I want to spend the next four years of my life uh, spending a lot of money and and a lot of time working really hard? Or do I want to spend the next four years of my life building a company and making money uh, to secure a good future? And I'm very happy with the choice that I made. Tell us a bit more about those early days. You talked about knocking on doors, you talked about giving free lessons. And we've got a, a good chunk of martial arts school owners listening. And we've got another, and I, I can't say how many, but uh, a good chunk of people who are training and, and are probably thinking, maybe at some point I'd like to have a school. I don't know yet. But this idea of teaching the way that you are isn't terribly common. Maybe it is in your area, but I can speak for the Northeast and the areas that I've traveled in. Martial arts-wise, there aren't a whole lot of people doing it your way. So I'd love to hear a bit more about how you got that started with whatever you're willing to share. You know, I don't want you to give away the secret sauce. Yeah. So well, I think one of the biggest differences between what I do and what a martial arts school owner does um, is that what I do is an introductory program. I don't have advanced students. And I know that so many really great martial artists that then become instructors and school owners love to see that progression in their students. They love to see people grow up in their program, go through the ranks and really become proficient martial artists. 
as awesome as that sounds, that's not my passion. I love that I have an introductory program that's going to introduce students to the beauty of martial arts and get them excited enough to then go and join a dojo and hopefully get their black belt from there. We have so many awesome success stories of children that were able to do that um, through martial arts programs outside of ours. And I'm always happy to refer them to schools in our area. Um, my passion is getting the door open for them and making martial arts accept, um, accessible for them. Because as I mentioned before, you know, martial arts tends to be um, a pretty time consuming and expensive activity. And if I can bring that if I can bring the passion of martial arts to two kids at a young age, get them excited enough to choose that over other sports in the beginning, then I think I'm doing my job. So it's there's a really big difference, I think, in, in the two different ways to bring martial arts to kids. And I totally understand why a lot of really proficient, amazing martial artists choose to open schools instead of do what I do. Because we aren't in the kind of business that I have, I don't get to see kids become proficient at martial arts. I don't get to see them you know, every week getting closer to their black belt. I see them in those really sloppy first stages where they can't make a fist and their front kick is more of a swing kick and, um, you know, all the, all the sloppiness that comes with a, a three-year-old trying to practice martial arts for sure. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely a very big difference between, between those two types of programs. Um, and it definitely takes somebody, I think, that's more interested in working with children than in martial arts to do what I do. I think if you're more interested in martial arts, you're going to get frustrated over the fact that you're constantly having new kids come into the program, constantly teaching them how to make a fist. You're constantly teaching them how to chamber their leg. Um, so it definitely, definitely takes a, a special personality and not something that every martial artist is cut out for. Mm. So what, what do you kind of hang your hat on? If it's not proficiency of technique, if it's not rank and, and watching them, you know, grow up for years, which is, you know, what we hear from a lot of martial arts instructors saying, you know, this is why I do this. Why? What is, what is it you go home at night and say, you know, I feel satisfied with my work today because of X? Um, it's, it's, for me, a lot of it is the sheer number of children that we've had go through our program, even if they've only been in for one unit of curriculum, which we have three every year. Even if they're just in it for one unit of curriculum, I know that they have learned some very important life lessons. We have life skills that they're learning. You know, um, they're about to start learning integrity and leadership, and they learn um, definitions based on those things and then stories. And then they break a board at the conclusion of each of our units. And so I know that even if the kid just goes through one unit, they just break one board with us, they're going to be learning some, some very important life lessons. Um, including confidence, you know, the ability to stand up in front of a crowd and break the board is huge for kids' confidence. I take boards to um, some corporate businesses around the city. They'll have me come in and do board breaks for them. And these adults are so amazed with themselves after they break a little piece of balsa wood, right? <laughs> and I'm like, imagine a three-year-old. They're on top of the world. They feel like they can accomplish anything after they do something like that. So that number of children that we get involved in the program, knowing that they're going to have specific life lessons that, lear that they're learning, and then overcoming fears and breaking boards and earning that confidence, that, that's what I think I have. Mm, I can see that. Is there any feedback from, let's, let's say, the conventional martial arts programs in the area about how these students do when they start there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the school that I study at right now, they get a ton of referrals from me because obviously I'm uh, part of both of the program. And um, it's it's going to be different for every child. I, I want them to have a strong foundation, at least of like those simple things like fists and chambers. Um, I want them to have that respect, knowing to bow to instructors, knowing about attention stances. Um, but more than anything... I feel that they need to have that focus going into the next program. So focus is a really big part of everything that we do in Crouching Tigers. We start with meditation and we're constantly working on what we call our tiger focus. Um, so I think that the kids that go from my program into any martial arts, uh, you know, whether that be karate, jujitsu, taekwondo, um, anything that they're going to get involved in, 
um, they are going to have better focus and ability to pay attention to instructors better than somebody that's brand new. Mm. What is what is meditation for a three year old look like? Oh, it's so awesome! <laughs> it's my thing. Um, so a few years ago, I started noticing a really big decrease in my students' ability to pay attention to class. And it wasn't just me that was noticing it. It was all of my instructors complaining to me. You know, we've got um, at our height, pre-COVID, of course, uh, about 1,300 students. So we're out there teaching tons of kids throughout the week. And my instructors were coming back to me and saying, these kids aren't learning anything. Like they're not focusing. They're running around in class, talking to their friends. And I just started realizing that that there has been this really, really serious decrease in um, children's focus. So what can, what can we do about it? And um, I was in a yoga teacher training at the time, you know, just always trying to learn new skills and figure out how to implement them into my program and started becoming pretty serious about meditation and um, having a daily practice and this ability to clear my mind before trying to, trying to learn something new. And so I started trying out all different things in my classes, different meditations I could teach them, whether I'm taking them on a little journey with their eyes closed and I'm telling them a story, um, little games that you could play. And um, I learned about sound meditation. And we started using something that's traditionally called a singing bowl, where we strike the singing bowl one time and the sound lasts for about 14 seconds. And so I started using that in class with this idea of let's keep our eyes closed while we can hear the sound of this. And when the sound is gone, we can open our eyes. And it was a immediate change in my students' ability to pay attention. Even these young three-year-olds would sit there with their eyes closed. I would strike this singing bowl. They, they keep their eyes closed until the sound was gone. Like I said, just 14 seconds. And they would, close, they would open their eyes and it would be like a new kid. And I was really, really amazed. I know it, it probably to you sounds too good to be true. And I know it does to a lot of parents, but seeing this thing in action is really exciting. Um, so right now we call it our tiger chime. Um, I wrote a children's book on it. It's called Your Chime and um, it's available on our website. It comes with the singing bowl as a way for parents to practice at home or martial artists to use within their classes. Um, and it's it's been really a uh, mm way to get our kids to focus we also talk about this term monkey mind and monkey mind is what happens when you can't focus and and all you have to do is use this time and you can get tiger focus from it. you can get rid of your monkey mind and it's so amazing to see these kids just really understand this concept and for it to really work for them i know it's, it's only 14 seconds but i'm telling you it's a huge huge difference for them I believe it. It makes a lot of sense. It checks a lot of the boxes. It's a it's a demarcation in time. It's a transition point between when they were doing what they are were doing and now what they're going to be doing, and it's something for them to focus on the sound. And what I I'm guessing, and you know, I I'm far from you know any kind of psychologist, but my guess is that because they can hear the sound peter out, they it, it it's it's more tangible. It's something that they can focus on for that time because they can tell that it's coming to an end. Yep. As opposed to most of us that were raised in or participate now in a traditional martial arts class that may lead in with some meditation. How long do you meditate? Until the instructor tells you to stop. Yeah. Which can be a little difficult. And if you're a kid, I, I remember growing up with that going, how, how we've been sitting here for a while. I don't know. Maybe sensei has got some stuff that she's, she's trying to work out. I, I, I don't know, but I'm still here and I'm ready to be done. And my mind wanders of course. But as you hear that sound fade out of the chime, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I like it. Yeah. What else so did you try? What did you try that didn't work? Um, the guided meditations, um, I think if their minds a little bit too busy. So when I'd be like, okay, let's pretend that you're, you're on a beach. Like, I'm going to go swimming. <laughs> no, like, let's focus on the waves. Are they cold? You know, they have a lot of questions when you look at a guided meditation. Um, so those weren't as successful for me. Um, I do have a little, a little game that I would play that worked very well for them. Um, but it's the sound. And I think their ability to focus on just one thing um, during this, this small period of time, I think is kind of rare for kids these days. I think there are so many things that overstimulate them in their lives that to have even 14 seconds where they're just focused on one sound and waiting for that sound to end that really makes that big difference for them. Mm. Get it. 
Now, I'm, we can all wrap our minds around what you've learned as a martial artist. We can wrap our minds around what these children have learned from you. But let's flip that. What have you learned from them? You know, we just kind of talked about a good example about how, you know, certain things that seem simplistic to us as adults may be incredibly effective for them. But I can't imagine you've been doing this for as long as you have and not continue to feel uh, like you're getting something out of it, like you're, you're, you're being nourished from this time with these children. So what else have they taught you? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned throughout running this program is that you can, you can get through to children so much faster by making things exciting for them. And that's, that's why I think martial arts is just such an awesome way to teach important life lessons. If I were just to stand in front of kids and be like, okay, I'm going to teach you this meditation and I'm going to teach you about integrity and leadership, I don't think that I would have anywhere near the impact on kids as I've had by throwing and kicking and punching to go along with it. Um, so we sort of use martial arts as this vehicle to teach important lessons to them. So it's like, um, we call it the um, the spinach and the ice cream. So we've got to have we've got to have our spinach in there. We have to have our life skills. We have to have our safety lessons and you know confidence building and things that a kid isn't going to think is that much fun just by itself. But the ice cream, that's the punching and the kicking and the games and the key eyes and all of that that makes this a very well-rounded program. So I think adding um, that level of excitement for them, you're able to teach them just just so much more. Hmm. Makes sense. Tell us about a point where it just, where it didn't go well, where something went completely off the rails. Maybe it's a particular child or a particular class, or you said, you know, we're going to start doing things in this way. And that way was horrible. And you had to walk it back. You know, we, we've talked a lot of, about, about a lot of positive things so far today. Sure. Let's, let's, let's talk about a, a learning opportunity. Oh man, I have so many stories. I mean, if you think about it, like the the sheer number of classes that I've taught, I think that I'm totally up there with with some of these like 50, 60 year old instructors that have been doing it their whole lives. <laughs> because I, um, you know, building this company and up until you know somewhat recently, I was teaching you know eight classes a day, and that's something that I think is pretty rare for for martial artists. So I have. I have tons and tons of stories about failures for sure. Um, but I think as a program, one really big failure for me was um, was five years ago, I had this idea that I needed to add something to our program that martial arts just really wasn't enough. I wanted I wanted something um, broader. And so I rebranded it as a children's wellness program that offered martial arts and yoga to kids. And it was a huge, huge failure for us, not only because the kids weren't getting um, a good amount of martial arts, so their skills were, were pretty terrible, um, but from a branding standpoint, parents, I think, really like to to um, quickly summarize what their kids are involved in. You know, my kid is in karate and dance and gymnastics. And to say, oh, my kid's in this wellness program just really didn't work. So for me, I was trying to combat the, now that I realized it, small number of parents that was anti-martial arts by adding yoga to it and calling it a wellness program. Um, so that, that was just a, a big, huge mistake on my part, a very expensive and very time consuming one because I had really rebranded my entire company, um, really to just kind of apologize to my my families and my centers and say, you know, I'm really sorry, shouldn't have done this. We're going back to, to being a martial arts program. We're gonna wear that that tag of martial arts very, very proudly. Um, at the time there were there were a lot of parents that I was hearing from that were just saying, I would never get my kid in martial arts. You know, that's it's violent and saying you're teaching them this and that, and they're already punching and kicking their brother and sister so much at home. I don't want them to do it with more proficiency, you know. Um, and so looking back at that though, I recognize that that it's a small group of, of families and one that we have to be okay just saying, okay, well, we're never gonna be able to teach your kids. We're never gonna be able to deliver these awesome life lessons to them because of your um, disinterest in martial arts. So that was, that was probably, I think, my biggest failure over the years was, was that rebrand and trying to um, almost stray away from martial arts as a whole and rebrand as this wellness program 
and you know, martial arts now is something that we very, very proudly wear in our title. Mm. How did you, I want, I want to unpack that a little bit because what I'm hearing as a, as a fellow business owner is, whoa, I was really wrong. And I know how emotional that can be, but you're, you're either, either doing a really good job of playing it off. Like it wasn't that big of a deal or, um, I'm guessing more so that you learned a lot from it. So how did, how did you adjust coming back out of that? Well, it was actually, it was much easier to get out of it than it was to get into it. Um, because getting into it was telling my families, Hey, you thought you signed up for martial arts, but guess what? We're, we're different now. We're, we're wellness now. We're a wellness program and we're going to be teaching yoga in every class. And I guess what I didn't recognize at that time was that there are just as many people against yoga as there are against martial arts. And a lot of them have their kids in martial arts that are against yoga. Um, so that was, that was a big, uh, big learning curve there for me. Um, I'm sorry, what was your question again? Uh, just around the, the psychology of, of hitting a, a stumbling block with a business and, you know, one that was kind of big. I mean, you were trying to make a big shift mm -hmm. and that shift didn't work. And so coming back out and um, I guess it, it's, it's the process of, of iterating, of learning from those. Uh, I, I don't want to say failure because failure means you stop, but I guess mistake or misreading of the tea leaves. You, 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 you didn't just willy nilly say, Oh, we're going to, we're going to add yoga and become wellness. You had a, a concerted reason. There was an intent there you were trying to solve a problem mm -hmm. and it didn't work out the way you wanted it to. So that I just, maybe I'm applying too much of my own experience in asking this question. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm not somebody that takes criticism all that well, um, especially when it's from a group of people whose children I want to have an impact on. Hearing them say, no, I will never enroll my children in a martial arts program because I find it to be violent is really, really tough on me and just set me searching for answers. What am I going to do so that I'm not missing out on this demographic of kids because I know that every kid benefits from this program? What can I do to reach these kids? Instead of recognizing, hey, there's going to be a, a solid percentage of families who won't enroll in the program because they don't think martial arts is good for kids. And you just have to be okay with that. And you have to focus on the families that you do have in your program and make it the very best program that you have for those kids. Uh, I think that's, that's where the real failure came in was my inability to accept that there are families whose kids are never going to benefit from our program. Mm. Um, so that, that took some time for me to really become okay with it. Um, and it, it took, honestly, for us losing a lot of families who said, no, 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 I didn't sign up for a wellness program. I didn't sign up for yoga. I want my kid in martial arts. I want them learning introductory martial arts because they might want to go on and, and go to a school and get their black belt at that school after. So that, I think, was the big failure for me. And have you reconciled with that are you okay with that that not everyone's gonna want to put their kid in a martial arts program yeah yeah most definitely um i have a yoga program it's not functioning right now uh, for covid related purposes or reason um but it's a uh, it's a, a yoga program that is run more by schools um it's called animal skills yoga and i'm still able to get some of those important lessons that we teach in Crouching Tigers through this yoga program. Um, so that made me feel a little bit better about it. That, hey, you know, there are some families that are super against martial arts. Maybe they will enroll their kids in my yoga program, though. Mm. Okay. Makes sense. So what else? Tell us, tell us about a day for you. How much, how much time are you spending, let's say, on the mats teaching Matt, in this case, I think is figurative more than literal. Uh, how much time are you spending working on the business? You know, this is, you're teaching a lot. I mean, maybe not right now, right now, but in general, you've got more classes, as you said, than I think the average martial arts instructor. So I'm kind of wondering when you have time to do the other things. 
Yeah, so I um, so there are two pretty big events for me this year. One, I had a baby in March, and two, congratulations. You know, COVID happened. Really, really at, like right at the yeah. same. Both these things were happening, which isn't actually a terrible thing for those things to happen together. Um, so before um, having my daughter in March, I was slowing down on the teaching. Um, as, as much as, as I was able to teach, you know, being nine months pregnant, it was just kind of getting more and more difficult to, to get around quickly, (laughs) um, chase after all these three-year-olds, you know? Um, so I have a really awesome team in place that, um, I've really been able to kind of promote over the years. And so people that started out with me as instructors, I was able to promote to like assistant program directors and then program directors. So I have a couple of levels now, which is really nice. That gives me the ability to pop in, watch classes, be a guest teacher in those classes, um, but focus more on the curriculum and on building the business. So unfortunately, in our crazy COVID times that we're in right now, I'm not able to do as much of the building the business and promoting it and expanding it to new areas. Um, it's just a difficult time um, specifically for this industry to really grow. So the focus is more on the curriculum side of things. Uh, so I get to do my favorite things, which are, um, you know, writing the stories that go um, into the curriculum, coming up with self-defense techniques that are accessible for very young children, um, filling some videos for our children to watch virtually, for them to be played in classes and also for our instructor training um, and just really working on making it the best well-rounded program that I can. Um, a lot of that comes down to, of course, instructor training. I could teach, you know, the most amazing class ever, but if somebody on my team is out um, teaching it not up to par, um, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So really focusing on what our instructor training looks like and ensuring that uh, they have proper technique and that that proper technique is getting executed in class and resulting in, in children having having good techniques as well. This is probably a good time to let you tell people where they might find this stuff. You know, yeah. website, social media, we'll, we'll come back, but good time for a commercial. Sure. Yeah. CrouchingTigers.com uh, is where you can find all the information about our program. Right now, we are um, working out of the Indianapolis area, um, central Indiana as a whole. Um, so you can find us at CrouchingTigers.com, Facebook.com slash CrouchingTigers. Uh, you can find me personally on Instagram, um, Tornado Roni is my name on Instagram. As you know, my tiger character's name is Tornado. I love it. I love it. All right. And let's talk about your goals. We've talked about the now. We've talked about the then. What about going forward? You know, is is Crouching Tigers it? Is that is that your life's per- pursuit to grow it and expand it as much as you can? Or maybe are there other things you're thinking about? That's a really great question. Um, I think Crouching Tigers will always be something that plays a a big role in my life and my career. Um, I am very interested in children's books right now. Um, And so I have this meditation book that's out, like Your Chime, and trying to really expand my my library here. Um, Getting those important life lessons to children through stories has always been really my biggest passion. Um, so if I can do that outside of a martial arts program, I'm able to impact a lot more kids. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's that group of kids that won't ever be impacted by a martial arts program. That if I'm um, able to put out children's books with those really great life lessons in it, then I can impact a, a larger group of children. So I think more of those is in my future. Um, and then really expanding Crouching Tigers, hopefully to new areas as well as online through our virtual program. Um, We have a goal, and when I say have, this was like pre-COVID goal, Um, but within the next five years, we wanted to reach a million boards broken through our program. Um, Very, very far off from that goal right now, but really trying to 
work on explaining different ways that kids can break boards within our program to count towards that goal. Um, Because as as I mentioned earlier, kids breaking boards is just such an awesome way to build their confidence up that is going to be useful for them in in so many other areas than just martial arts. I completely agree. Wow. This has been a good talk. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time and for sharing and everything. And one last thing, what are your final words? What parting, whatever, (laughs) would you like to leave the listeners with today? Um, We know that you've got a lot of uh, martial arts school owners. So I guess I'll just reiterate how important, um, how big of a role martial arts can be in a young child's life. And as much as it might not be fun to watch somebody get really proficient in skills, know that um, as an adult with a black belt on in front of them, you have this amazing ability to really make a huge impact on a young child's life. And that's all. One of the things that I enjoy about the show is that when we ask these very simple, straightforward questions, the way people answer them tells us so much about who they are and why they do what they do. And today was no different. Sensei Roni clearly loves kids, but I think it's pretty obvious that so much of her passion for teaching children comes from the value she received as a child. Martial arts is such a transformational experience for so many people. And of course, here we have yet another person saying the same thing and taking it even a step further to make sure probably the most underserved demographic of people, very young children, get the chance to experience the benefit of martial arts. And I applaud that. I wish we had more programs like this. And for those of you interested, you should probably go check out the website. At the very least, I bet we got some wheels turning, and I appreciate that. So thank you, Sensei, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. If you want to see more about this episode or any other episode we've done, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for links and show notes and transcripts and so much more. And if you're up for supporting us in all that we do, we have lots of options. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15. You can also leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekicks, where you want to go for that. Remember, if you see somebody out there wearing something with a whistle kick on it, say hello. And if you've got feedback, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.